Okay. Um, Let's get started. You can see that I uh, Whoa, wow. do some little wow. boundaries Thanks to help us look at the sections that are concave up and concave down. Okay, so the concave down places are what color? Yellow. Blue. Yellow. Blue. Blue. And the Blue. concave up sections are yellow. 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 Okay. Concave looks like for F. Huh? Concave for F. For F. Okay. Okay. Um, when we talk about this uh, concavity, specifically concavity, we only care about concavity for the function. We don't care about if the second derivative is concave up or down, or if the first derivative is concave up or down. Uh, typically, it's sort of like a really special case. Typically, we just are talking about the concavity of f, the original function. Okay. Uh, when we talk about extrema, maximum and minimum values, uh, most of the time we're talking about f, right? F is the function we're interested in. We will be interested in the value, the extreme values of F prime, right? But not so much F double prime. Okay, so a little bit of that. And I want to start today by looking at uh, one main simple way that we use the second derivative in concavity. Okay, then we're gonna have to go back. It's not gonna be enough. All right. Um, so let's get started. So we can see these regions right here where f is concave up, it's concave up, it's concave up right there. Yeah. Okay. So when f is concave up, f double prime is, what's the correlation? Concave down. Concave down. Concave down. Let's see. Uh, it's concave up here. Um, okay. Uh, it's not necessarily concave oh, down. It's just the opposite. Some overlap there, but that's not a guarantee. It's not concave up. F prime is positive. F prime is, and that's why I said the y value, the y value, I didn't say, I was very specific. I said the y value of F prime, double prime, F double prime. Okay? So I was very specific about that on purpose. F double prime, yes, is definitely positive if your first function is concave. Up, and it's definitely negative if your first function is concave down. Your second derivative might be concave down as f is concave up. I haven't, I don't know, I haven't given a lot of thought to that. We could, we could explore that. But easier than all that, because if we want to test for concavity, we're seeing that we're going to need to take the second derivative of something. So if I want to see if the second derivative is concave up or down, I'm going to take the second derivative of the second derivative. We don't want to mess with that. Okay. What's easier than that is just the y value. It's definitely guaranteed that if this function is concave up, the first function is concave up, then the second derivative will be positive. It will definitely be positive. Okay. And if it's concave down, if the original function is concave down, you can see that the value of f double prime is negative. Okay. Um, you can you can pretty much see that from the from the graphs. They're just hand sketched graphs. Okay, so um, might not be able to see it perfectly, but we can't talk about it, and we can convince ourselves that it has to be true. It has to be true. Why don't you have that? You don't need to. Okay. You can see their eyes. It's a little L. Did you say <laughs> what are those letters? No, you said. I was just wondering. Okay. Sassy. Sassy. You asked, and I gave you an answer. Hey, but you answered it all sassy. Yeah. Well, how else can I do it? That's all I have. <laughs> okay, so how can we use? This is what I'm saying. We're we're gonna look at one application, an application that's not not too difficult. And we're gonna go back and look at things like Clinton selection and that kind of stuff. But how can we use zero slopes along with concavity? 
to find extrema? Uh, right? Okay, so why don't we use that with concavity? Okay, so we when we find like f prime equals zero, yeah. we find like f double prime is positive or negative. Yeah. And f double prime is uh, positive, then it's a minimum. Uh -huh. And f double prime is negative, it's a maximum. Okay, very good. So if we look at all these, um, at least f prime is zero, right? That's where we get a zero slope, flat. It's horizontal there, it's horizontal there, and there. Okay. So we come across this first one right here, f prime is zero, the slope is zero. Okay. And at the same time, uh, the graph is concave down. So if it's concave down, it means it's you know frowning face, upside down bowl, or whatever. Uh, if it has a zero slope and it's concave down, you gotta be looking at a maximum. Yeah. And vice versa, if it's a uh, zero slope and it's concave up, we must be looking at a minimum. Okay. So that is the, the basics of the second derivative test. The second derivative test is the thing we use to find extreme values, to find a maximum or a minimum. Okay. So the way that goes is we take the derivative, let's find this say f prime, right, and then we uh, set f prime equal to zero. And then we test the concavity at the solutions of f prime of x equals zero. Um, we solve f prime of x equals zero. We find those x values where f prime of x equals zero. Then at those places, those are our candidates for maxima and minima. And then uh, if it's a maximum, it would have to be concave down. There's no other way for it to be a maximum. I mean, there's other criteria that you could use, but it's absolutely a guarantee that if it is uh, a zero slope and it's a maximum, that it would have to be concave down, vice versa for min minimum values, okay? So we will do a couple examples like that. We're just gonna s find some extreme values using the second derivative use the first derivative test. That was where we found a zero slope, and if it was increasing on the right side and decreasing on the left side, we had positive slopes here, negative slopes here, then we had our maximum, and vice versa for minimum, decreasing to increasing. But now, we don't have to test on the left and the right, we just test at this point. Okay. So it's easier. A little bit easier. Okay, now how do I test for concavity? Uh, so, you, so if you have a place where you want to know if it's concave up or concave down, just take that value, like x is 3, and plug it into the second derivative. If it's positive, it's concave up. If it's negative, it's concave down. Okay. Whoa, I don't know what that's right now. Yeah. Can you go back to the graph real quick? I have yeah. a question. Uh -huh. So say f is velocity, right? So yes. Like f prime acceleration and f prime, f double prime is the change in acceleration. Yeah. As the change in acceleration increases, the velocity is decreasing. As the change, okay, here we go. The change in acceleration is increasing. Uh, right here. Yeah. It could be doing either. The velocity is increasing here. It's decreasing here, and at both places, the change in acceleration is is going up. The change in acceleration is a is a fairly difficult thing to make intuitive. If your position, velocity, and acceleration are easier for us to grasp, the change in acceleration, I haven't even given it a lot of thought, so to just to understand how you could be changing your acceleration uh, and it getting, like the change becoming bigger, but the velocity becoming smaller. Isn't it just because it's like the rate, well the acceleration is just the rate of change and it could be changing for positive or negative, but it's just the where it was so one is like it's two miles an hour faster or slower, but it's two because it's just like it's because of that or it's positive mm -hmm. acceleration is always mm -hmm. I don't know. I would have to give it some thought. I like I like that you 
ask it, I don't really have a good answer for you. I don't know if you do that. All right. Like, did, like, I, my thinking is honed towards common topics in the subjects that I teach, and the change in acceleration of the jerk is not something that is ever brought up. So I haven't had time to think about it. All right. So remind me some other time when we'll, we'll see uh, if we can figure that out. Um, okay, so let's look in um, 3.4. We're just going to work on using the second derivative of the test. Okay. For the moment. Really want to spend time on this because it's been confusion before. Um, the second derivative test is not one that helps you find, it's, it's not the test for points of inflection. That's a common misconception. The second derivative test is used for the exact same thing the first derivative test is used for, and that's finding what? Extrema. Extrema. Okay, that's what it's used for. All right. getting too confused about the first derivative and the second derivative, what are we looking for? Extrema. Okay, we're looking for extrema. Where do extrema happen? Point at prime is zero. Very good. When the slope is zero, that's the only place that you can have a maximum or minimum value. Okay? I mean, we can we force that to be false, but if we're looking at an integral uh, from negative infinity to infinity, and we're talking about a, a domain that's a normal domain, then yeah, that prime would be zero. Means that it's the only place where you could possibly have a maximum or minimum value. Okay. Um, so first, we'll set f. Uh, yeah, f prime. Uh, well, I won't write f prime. I'll write this. Here, set it equal to zero. F prime will have to be equal to zero. Back at four x squared, x minus three. Zero. So let's see, x equals zero, x equals three. Agreed? Mm -hmm. okay. So those are the only two places that we could possibly have extrema. Okay, let's see. Uh, and what, are we, what would we be doing that for? Find if f, if double prime is positive or negative, what would that tell us? Concave. The concavity, and the concavity together with the zero slopes will tell us if we have maximum or minimum, or maybe we need to do some other work. Okay, so I'm gonna take this time to remind you that the little table thing, this chart, is really useful and I'm gonna be using it. Um, so, we've got our x values that we've found, or spaces in between those x values. Okay, what's the left? So what's the first x value that we found that we're, uh, we're interested in looking into? Zero, okay? So before zero though, we wanna go from <coughs> negative infinity up to zero, and then we'll go with x is zero, and then we'll go between zero and three, the interval between zero and And then three to infinity. At three, and then three to infinity. We're gonna look at f, depending on what the value of f is at x. Look at f prime. Look at f double prime. Okay. And 
of x, we just care about the value of f of x. How big is it? How small is it? We want to find those extreme values. F prime, we generally just like to know when it's 0, when it's positive, and when it's negative. And f double prime, we'd like to know when it's positive and when it's negative. <coughs> So let's get to that. Um, f of x doesn't have a specific value on an interval, so we'll forget about f of x on the intervals. Okay. What's f prime of x at 0? F prime of x at 0. We just found, you know, that's how we found this 0, was to set f prime of x equal to 0. So 0 there and there. So at these points, let, let's forget about in between right now, to the left or the right because we have the second derivative test. Okay. So what are we going to do with 0? Zero? 0, this 0, not this 0, but this 0. Plug it in. Yeah. Wow. Double, prime. Double prime, because then we're going to say, if the slope is 0, and I find that it's concave up, because we have a positive f double prime, then what do we have? What would be the conclusion? Minimal. So if I, let's, I'll state it again. At zero, we have a slope of zero. If you have a slope of zero and it's the second derivative is positive, what would we get? A minimum. Because we got positive, we got concave up, so it would be a minimum. And if it was negative, it was concave down, it would be a maximum. Okay. So we take zero and we put it <coughs> excuse me, into f double prime. What do we find? Zero. It's zero. Okay, let's leave that for a second. Let's come down to three. Wait, is that not f double prime or is it? Sorry. So f double prime is 0. We'll leave that for a second. Okay? Let's go to 3. I'll put 3 into f double prime. It's what? 36. 36. Now, do we care that the, is the, the number 36? What do we care about? That it's positive. positive. That it's positive. Just that it's positive. That's all. So it's positive, which means we can conclude that minimum. it's a minimum. So here's an example of the, of the second derivative test working perfectly. We find a place where the slope is 0. At that place, the concavity is up. So we conclude by the second derivative test that we have a minimum. Okay. Here, the second derivative test would go like this. If f prime is equal to 0 and f double prime is also equal to 0 at that same place, then the second derivative test just fails. We don't know anything. It could be a maximum, it could be a minimum, it could be neither. Okay? Now here, it worked out really nicely. Second derivative test uh, worked out. We only had to have one test point. That was the number three in f double prime. Before that, with the first derivative test, we would have had to test this interval and this interval, and then make our conclusion. Okay? So now all we have to do is find a value where the, the slope is zero, throw that number into f double prime and see what it is, if it's positive or negative, and then we're done. Yeah. So we don't have to write the intervals? Well, we do want to leave space for the intervals because now that the second derivative test has failed, let's fall back oh, on the first okay. derivative test. So how do, how do we use that first derivative test? What are we going to do on this interval from negative infinity to zero? Pick a point. Pick a point. Any x value in that interval, which negative one. Negative one, right? It's probably the most manageable number on that interval. And what do we do with it? The derivative, the first derivative. What? Would be positive? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me just see if I agree. I don't. Oh, no, he's right here. We got a negative one here. I have. So that'd be negative four minus 12 times negative one squared would be positive. Oh, wait. Also, I was looking at this double sign. Okay. My bad. So negative four minus 12 is what we guess would be negative. Okay, negative. So, what's the uh, what is the function doing on this interval? It's decreasing. It's decreasing. It's got negative slopes. It's coming down the whole time. Okay. On the right, now let's see what's happening. If it's increasing, then we've gone from decreasing to increasing. We've got a minimum. If it's decreasing as well, it's got a negative slope. Then it's not a maximum or a minimum. Okay. So we look to the right between One. zero and three. One. One's good. One, so it'd be negative. So it'd be four minus twelve. That's still negative. Okay. So we have a maximum or a minimum? Neither. No, we have neither. Uh, if, if we're, what we're trying to conclude here is about extrema, right? We just nothing interesting is happening. 
So that would just be like an S curve. So yeah. From your perspective, would be like right. right. It's decreasing, then it's zero, then it's decreasing again. So it's going to be something like that. Okay. Then it's got a minimum, and so it should go something like that. And you know, there's it's not going to turn around and go back down, right? Because then we would have found another yeah. uh, extreme value, zero slope. None of those things are happening, so it must just keep on going. Yeah, it's kind of a dented up parabola shape. Okay, now that did take a, a minute or so, but because I was explaining everything, we were reviewing all that stuff, you were telling me what to do. If we get good at this and we, we get on a roll, it wouldn't take very long to figure out that at zero, there's this zero slope, uh, and at three, there's this zero slope. Here it comes down like this, it's decreasing to de decreasing. We found that it's a zero slope and it's concave up, so it's a minimum. And then we know we just have to keep on going like this. Okay. Um, <coughs> um, and then we can find like that uh, these values right here, we can find these points. How can we find the, the actual y values of these points? Yeah, so uh, this value, this y value, we could actually put this into f. That would give us a value of 2, put 3 in there, and that would give us So at, uh, at 0, 2, we have a, a flattening out, but not a maximum or a minimum. At uh, 3, negative 25, we have a minimum. And well, we'll find more things in the future, but there's a couple of things that are pretty interesting. So that, that's the second part of the test. That's finding extreme values with the second group. Okay. There are other things that we're interested in. That's not enough, but that's the second group of the test. There's more. But there's a second group of the test. Why don't you guys um, open your books up to 3.4? And um, Use the second derivative test on 32. All I want you to do for 32, either the, the instructions, um, that, that's what the instructions say to do. It's just a, a step into you know, having more knowledge uh, right here, is using the second derivative test to find uh, the, all the extreme values, all the relative maximum and minimum. Um, 32, yeah, 3.4, open your book. Number 32. Extrema is where the function levels off for a second and has a zero slope. 3x squared minus 18x plus 27 equals zero. Back on 3. Zero. 3 times x minus 3 times x minus 3. So x equals 3. There's only one place where this function has a zero slope.
So at x is 3, f double or f prime is 0. Yep. We want to find out if it's an extreme, if it's a maximum or a minimum value. What do we do with 3 then? Put it into f double prime. F double prime, 6 times 3 is 18, minus 18 is 0. So the second derivative test Fail. fails. So we look to the left and to the right. At maybe 0 is nice. Yeah. Okay. 0 is nice because it's to the left of 3. So just be 27. So just be 27, so it'd be positive. So it's increasing. If you put that on our conclusion, it's increasing on the interval. Um, after that, we can put uh, 4 in there. Well, let's see. 4, that's going to be 16 times 3 minus 18 times 4 is 27. That feels positive. It's, it is positive. If you can yeah. plug it in your calculator and, and be for certain, yes. that will be positive. Um, so it's increasing, and so it's... Would not be a, it's just the spot where it happens to end. It just kind of flattens out and then keeps going. So it's increasing, and then it continues to increase. Uh, we can put 3 into the original function to find the actual point where that happens, which would be... Three into the actual original function. to be that we had a positive second derivative, that would mean what kind of concavity? Up, which means a minimum value. Yeah. Yes. Concave up, which means minimum. Hopefully that would like on that graph if, graph if it did hit a zero slope and stayed there for a while. Like, what would it look like when it's all like um, That's hard to say because then yeah. if that were true, if a function went up and if it was a zero slope for a while, like not just at one particular value, it could be. Or, or um, I think you, you would, yeah. That's one way that I could think that. I can't think of like a polynomial function that would do that. There isn't one that I, that I know of. Because um, what you would have is say on this interval, it's, it's flat, it's horizontal, which means you take the second or the first derivative. You set it equal to zero, and usually we'll find like two or three or four numbers where that happens. Well, on this interval, there's an infinite number of solutions, an infinite number of numbers where the first derivative would be zero. And so, how that would happen, I don't know. A piecewise function, you could definitely make it happen with a piecewise function. Make one function that comes up and is zero here, and then another function that's zero here that keeps going, and then in between here, we'll just have a constant function. It's a flat line. Yeah. I was just wondering. Yeah, I can't imagine a function that would just do that naturally. It's not piecewise. It's not kind of uh, a Frankenstein. Okay, so we need to go back. We need to talk about these things called points of inflection. So one thing that we get is the second derivative test that we've been using. Uh, we're finding extrema uh, if it's zero slope and concave down means the second derivative is negative, we have a maximum, and if it's concave up, which means the second derivative is positive, then we have a minimum. Now we want to talk about these points of inflection. We kind of want to talk about how can we be so sure that when it's concave up, it's, def it's guaranteed that f double prime will be positive. Okay, so these points of inflection and uh, this, 
is concave up being positive and concave down being negative definitely linked? Do you have some kind of an explanation of that? Say it intersects, but f double prime intersects f at the points of inflection. No. Not, no. Not, not definitely, and not usually. Uh, I yeah, should have maybe. Okay, I see it now. So, if I were to take um, f, the, the function f, I guess I shouldn't have drawn it so close to the x-axis. That, that could be confusing. But if I were to take this, this function f, and if I could move it, I would. But if I, if I did move it, like, way up here, way, way up here, well, the slopes would be the same, which is what f prime is telling me. And the way the slopes are changing would be the same, which is what f double prime is telling me, right? And there's no, that, so the, f, the, the graphs of f, and f, double, f prime and f double prime would not change if f were to go down or up. You see what I'm saying? And so definitely, if I were to move f down here, we wouldn't even consider them in, intersecting at the points of inflection. But what is a point of inflection? That's the change in like the concavity. Where the concavity changes. Okay. So where it changes from concave down to concave up or vice versa, these are points of inflection. Um, maybe to help ourselves out a little bit, we'll draw some new graphs so that maybe that confusion doesn't happen. Is it because when uh, the original function equals zero, there's no change taking place? And so, because f double prime is the change of the change, uh -huh. if there's nothing taking place anyways, that well, the double derivative can't be changed. And the only points, well, the only thing that can happen when there's no change is it can either go up or down. And I think I like know how to explain it, but it's obviously not right. It's so hard to yeah. to generalize for everybody, which is which makes this a really difficult subject to learn uh, and teach. So uh, this is supposed to be just a flat spot here, a maximum, a minimum, a maximum, a minimum. Okay, so if we wanted to graph the, the graph of f prime, how would we help ourselves graph f prime a little bit more easily? Prime where f has a horizontal slope. Yeah, so zero. zeros for f prime. Okay, so right there, there's a zero. There's a zero. So I found the zeros, now, now, now what do I do? You plug them into the function. Well, there's nothing to plug in. We're just talking about the picture. OK. OK, so we kind of want to just approximate this. That prime should look kind of like this, right? So we found the zeros. So apparently, something significant happens here. Um, it intersects the x-axis. It intersects the x-axis, OK. So what kind of? What, what can I expect from f prime on this side of the? It's going to go positive. It's positive. What about f prime is positive? The y values. The y value. The thing that is hard for students to grasp, even for a long, long time, is that when we say f has positive slopes, that means the y value of f prime is positive. Right? Not that there's no link between the slopes of f and the slopes of f prime. But that's not it. Okay. The link between the slopes of f and f prime is that the slopes of f are the y values of f prime. So we have positive slopes here, so we should see positive y values for f prime. Okay. Positive. So all, all the y values should be up here somewhere because we have these really big positive slopes, positive values. So this is going to be a really big positive y value. And here we have these really small positive slopes. So we're going to be getting closer and closer to a y value of zero. Okay, so positive values here, the little positive, positive, positive. Right. Uh, here we have negative slopes, and so we have negative y values. Right. So we have positive y values crossing into negative y values. Then we have negative y values crossing into positive y values. 
have negative slopes, so negative y values for the, uh, the derivative, uh, positive y values. And, here. and this is still positive y values even after this x-intercept. So still positive values. And then over here we have negative y values. So if you can sketch that out, you can get a, a good idea. We're going from negative values to positive values, positive values to negative values, negative to positive. Uh, positive back to positive. So we gotta kind of come down and back up like that. And then positive y values back down to negative. So these are positive forever, and they're just climbing because these positive slopes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, it seems. Okay, come back around, come back down here, maybe it's kind of big. Like that. There. And then you come back up down and into the negative y values because we have negative slopes. Okay. So before we look at the second derivative, let's look at the first derivative and what it's doing and maybe its connection to concavity. So we agreed that there's like this point here, uh, maybe here, and somewhere here, there, and there. What's happening at those places? Points of inflection. Points of inflection. The concavity is changing. Okay. Do you see a link between the slope of the function and the concavity? The points of inflection are where the slope of the prime is zero. Okay. So you're kind of you're you're. I'm going to go from A to B, you went from A to C, which is not bad. But let's go from A to B. So what's the, the connection between the, the slope of F and the concavity of F, the original function? The slope of F and the concavity of F, and where it's changing. Okay. What could you say about the slope of F at the place where the concavity is changing? This point of inflection. Least steep? Least steep. Most steep. Most steep. Okay? So we've got these, I'll just erase these here in a second, but we've got this slope, not very steep. Steep, steepest, and after that point of inflection, we get less and less steep. Right? So the value of the, of the slope is at its smallest or at its biggest, depending on if it's positive or negative. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's let's talk about it over here. But maybe that's the easy. The the slope is it's maxing out, right? It's kind of shallow. It's getting steeper. It's definitely its steepest when it when we're at the point of inflection. And after the point of inflection, we're getting less and less steep tangent lines. Okay. So it's maxing out, and we can see here about in that area, you know, my graph isn't perfect, but a roundabout, let me redraw it so it looks right, right about in that, we're right at that point where the, the uh, slope is maxing out, the function that tells us how big the slope is should be maxing out. The, the derivative is the function that tells us how big the slope is, and so we should see its biggest y value uh, of all, at least in that, on that interval. Um, so, if, uh, say if uh, this is the biggest slope around, then if we look at the slope function, the derivative, it should have its biggest value, it should be maxing out. Um, so, at the maximum, the maximum value of f prime, we see a point of inflection. Also at the minimum value, the minimum value is just where we see the steepest negative slope. Right? It's the biggest, but it's, it's negative, so it's actually a small number, so we actually find a minimum there. And here at this point of inflection, we change from concave up to concave down. That'll happen when you have positive uh, slopes. We find the biggest, the, the steepest slope, the biggest value of the slope, and here we have the minimum. Here, we are changing from concave down to concave up. So this turns out to be a point of inflection and a place where the slope is zero. 
and we see that there's this minimum value for the uh, for the derivative and a maximum in pools of one. Yep. So if this was drawn like perfectly accurate, uh, would the maxima on f also be the like points of inflection on f prime too? Um, So the only place where you could possibly have a point of inflection is where? Yeah, I think all those things were true, right? I couldn't listen to all of them at once, but uh, where we have a maximum or a minimum value of f, and now we kind of we're like cycling through, we're asking the same question: How do you find a maximum value of a function? Find its derivative. And uh, we can use the first you derivative set it equal to zero. You just set it equal to zero. If you want to find its maximum or minimum value, you set it equal to zero. Yeah. Now, uh, it's not necessarily guaranteed that you'll have a point of inflection, but those are the only places where points of inflection could happen. Is where the uh, where it maxes out, where the slope maxes out, or where it mins out, minimums out. I guess you could say. Okay. Which means. If we take the second derivative, then the places where the points of inflection happen or the second derivative is zero. Zero because the only place where a point of inflection can happen is where we have a minimum or a maximum on the on f prime. And to find maximum and minimum value, we take the derivative of a function that's set it equal to zero. Well, we're taking the derivative of this red function, which is already the derivative of the first function, so the derivative of the derivative. Here's a minimum, a maximum, a minimum, a maximum. There's a minimum, and a <laughs> maximum. And this just weird. Can yeah. Trick, can I make it not blue? Because I find blue goes a lot like black. Okay. Um, Green. 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 Taco. Purple. Purple. What are you doing for Thanksgiving? Oh, we always have uh, Thanksgiving at a, a family's church. Our family's a uh, house. For so you got negative slopes here. Up until here, we have a zero slope. So negative uh, values, negative y values for the second derivative. You've got positive slopes here for the first derivative, which take the derivative of. So positive slopes here. You've got negative slopes after that, and positive slopes after that, and negative slopes after that, and then positive slopes after that, and negative slopes after that. Okay, so we get negative, negative second derivative to positive, to negative, to positive, negative, to positive again, to negative, negative, and negative from there on out. So we have that if, if f double prime is positive, then we have concave up, which means if, if f double prime has to be positive, then the cutoff for being positive or negative would be <coughs> at zero. Right? That's the boundary between positive numbers and negative numbers is zero. Okay. And we've, kind of, we've gone the correct way and we've said that the points of inflection will happen, concavity will change when we have the steepest slope. The steepest slope means that on the first derivative, we'll have either a minimum or a maximum value. If the first derivative has a minimum or a maximum value, and we're going to find that minimum or maximum value, we need to take the derivative of it and set it equal to zero. Okay. So that is going to allow us to find points of inflection. Okay. Yeah. I have another question. Yeah. And it might not work, but I also noticed that there's always extrema on f double prime where it is. Yeah. Never mind. That's already wrong. But I was thinking if you took the double derivative of a function and set that equal to zero, won't that also give you extrema on f, but it'll be easier? Like, and again, uh, no. That's not going to be a, a guarantee. Yeah. yeah. So that's this is kind of just like a random question, but deals with Einstein. 
So when if you keep doing the derivatives and you just keep going more and more, would it eventually turn into like a parabola? Because well, it all depends. Usually, it just depends on the function you're using. Okay. Yeah, if we're talking about a polynomial function, it'll wind up being at some point, you know, you've probably noticed that if we start with a, a seventh degree polynomial, well, the next one would be six. Mm -hmm. So eventually you get to a degree two, then you get even to a degree one, so just be a slanted line, and then it would just be a constant, and then you take the derivative of that would be zero. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. Um, so, So that's a polynomial function, but if we're using like a trig function like sine, the derivative of sine is cosine, derivative of that is negative sine, derivative yeah. of that is negative cosine, derivative of that is sine, and we're back in, it could have just cycled through. So, so it just depends on the, okay. the function that you're using. Okay. So now using the second derivative, we have all the stuff we can find. And first derivative and second derivative. We can find um, increasing, decreasing, We can find maximum and minimum values. We can find points of inflection. <coughs> and this, I mean, we're going to use all these um, in the immediate future to graph functions without having to have a calculator to tell us what they look like. We can find really important things like maximum values, minimum values, end behavior we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, points of inflection, all these different things. And we can, we can put these points on the graph and draw our, our graph through those points in the way that they're supposed to be uh, used. And we have a good, a really good graph of that function. The I mean, uh, ultimately, the, the, the AP test is going to ask quite a few questions about the points of inflection and your understanding of the definition of points of inflection. Okay, so we're also going to need to be pretty well versed in that. Okay. So, <coughs> so we're going to get some concentration on that. But for now, let's find some points of inflection. Fairly easy example, that's the 3.4, again, 3.4. Um, do uh, the number 12. Number 12. Find the points of inflection. Just looking for points of inflection, right? Just points of inflection, just to take some of the pressure off. Um, all right. So, points of inflection can only happen where what? F prime is zero. F prime is zero. F double prime is zero. Which means what about F prime? Has a slope of zero. F prime has a slope of zero. If f prime has a slope of zero, means we're looking at the steepest slope in that interval, that whole interval. It's maxing out or it's minimizing out, which means that it's its steepest, which means that must be where it's starting to switch from concave up to concave down and vice versa. So only where f double prime is equal to zero will we find points of inflection. So we have to find f prime to find f double prime. 6x squared minus 3 no, 6x minus uh, 12. Double prime equals 12x minus 6. Okay. Are you agreeing with something? Uh-huh. Okay. So we take the second derivative, we take it, we set it equal to 0. So x equals 1 half. Oh. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. One half. Um, so what's going on at 1 half? There's a zero of f double prime. Yeah. That's what we know for sure. Is there a point of inflection? Can't be sure. Okay. It's 
good to know that you're not sure if there's a point of inflection. Um, what's the only way we can know if there's a point of inflection? First derivative test. First derivative, First derivative right. test is for binding you extrema. We're binding. You have to plug in points to the left and right of, of one half into the. the uh, I believe it. E. E. To what? F double, F double prime, because the definition of a point of inflection is this change in concavity. That's what has to happen. So if we want to see if there's a change in concavity, we got to look at the function that tells us about concavity, F double prime. Okay, so we'll take uh, to the left of 1 half and to the right of 1 half. So 0 and 1. 0 and 1 are a good one. So 0 gives us negative 6, so it's negative, negative which means About f, if this is negative, we just plugged in zero. We took zero, put it in there. Twelve times zero minus six equals negative six. That's f double prime of zero is negative. So that means concave down. Concave down. Yeah. <coughs> and f double prime of one. That's twelve times one. Minus 6 equals 6, positive, which means it's concave up. Up, concave down. Cup. Yeah. Cup. <coughs> Would we have to, can we pick like any points on either side of that one? Or we wouldn't be able yeah. to because it's only. Because on the left, it's the only place you can change concavity, the only way possible is where f double prime is equal to 0. We found the only place where f double prime is equal to 0. Okay. Not guaranteed to be a point of inflection, but it is guaranteed that to the left, it will have all one kind of concavity, to the right will have all one kind of concavity. Okay. So any point to the left, any point to the right. Will work. So we've got concave down and concave up, so it is a point of inflection. So point of inflection. Whoa. Ah, now this is a point, a point on the graph. A point always has an x and a y, so a point at one half, comma. Three halves. Three halves, how do we find that? Like in the top one. The original yeah. equation, and so you got three halves on it? Yeah, but I'm gonna write it right. Okay. It's two times one eighth minus three times one fourth. Yeah, I got three two, halves as well. Yeah. Okay. You got three halves? Yeah. yeah. All right, two. That's enough confirmation for me. One half comma three halves is our point. When we say point, we mean point of inflection. Okay. 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 So here's some easy questions. Let's start easy and then work up. So when is the function concave up? So I want to find out where that function is concave up go. These are intervals right here. thing we'll do, we'll take h prime, 3x squared minus 6x minus 19, take h double prime, 6x minus 6, okay? Now, it, it wants to know all the places, the, the full interval where it's concave up, which means you need to know where it starts being concave up, okay, or stops being concave up. The only way we can find out where it stops being concave up or begins being <coughs> concave up is that place where it changes, that point of inflection. So we set this equal to zero, and we'll solve and get one. Now if we're really confident, what's our answer? D. D, D is the only one that has a number one in it. Right? If we're really good at what we do, 
And that's got to be it. We know that it either, but by doing this, we know that uh, it could possibly start or end being concave uh, up or down. Well, start or end being concave up at one. Okay. The the only other possibility is maybe if there was a negative infinity to infinity, like it's always concave up, and we have this anomalous h double prime equals zero at one. But it's it's not this. There's only one interval with one in it. There's, there's no other possibilities. If we weren't too confident, we could keep going and we could say, well, this is possibly a point of inflection. So to the right of it, we could, it could be concave up or down, and to the left, it could be concave up or down. It might switch and it might not. Okay, so let's find out. We'll look to the left of that. We'll put in zero where? Where would we put zero into? F double prime and see if it is negative. positive or negative. It's negative. It's negative, it's concave down. So it's not concave down over there. It's not concave down from negative infinity to one. All right? That further confirms this has got to be it, but I haven't fully confirmed it by making sure that F double prime is positive. So we put in two, put two here, 12 minus six, that's positive. So it is positive, it is concave up uh, from one and up, from one and bigger. Okay. Um, all right, so this is a pretty good one. Let's actually go to this one. Move on to this one for a second. So the rate at which, and we've seen this question before, the rate at which a baby bird gains weight is proportional to the difference, blah, 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 blah. They give you this equation, and the rate at which a baby bird is growing, right? The, the B meaning the weight of the baby bird, uh, the, the way in which it's changing with respect to time is given by this expression, one fifth times 100 minus B. So this is already a rate of change equation. It's giving the rate of change of the baby bird. How fast it's changing is what you get when you plug in the current weight of the bird. Okay. So this is part B of the question. It says find, what is this? The second derivative. The second derivative of this or just the second derivative? Like, how do we find this? Derive the first derivative. And we'll be done? Yeah. yeah, we'll be done. This is the first derivative of something, right? Yeah. There's like a, a weight function. It's like before this one. We take the change of that, that's the rate of change of the weight, and then the second derivative of the original function, which would be the derivative of this function. So this is like already the derivative of some function. So if we want the second derivative, we'll just take the derivative of that with respect to, um, with respect to time, right? That's what it's saying right here, with respect to time, dDt. So let's find that second derivative first, d squared b dt. How do we take the derivative of that function with respect to time? One-fifth. One-fifth, we got the constant multiple rule saying one-fifth times the derivative of this. Because the derivative of 100 yeah. is zero. The derivative of negative b with respect to t. Oh, with respect to t. Oh, no. Is? Mm -hmm. t. Mm -hmm. It's what? DB dt is, is negative DB dt. Negative DB dt. And we know that DB dt is this function. D, the second derivative here. It's equal to one fifth times, one fifth times 100 minus B. That's what db dt is, but it's a negative. Negative db dt. Which is negative 120 times 100 minus b. Okay. So that's the second derivative. second derivative of the function, the function that is the second deri derivative of, of what function? The weight function. Um, the weight function. It just tells you the weight, not the change, 
and weight, but just the weight itself at any time. So use that to explain why the graph of B, that being just the weight, cannot resemble the following graph, could not be this graph. So how can we use this, the second derivative of supposedly this function, this, this B function, the weight function, how can we use this to tell us that couldn't possibly be, this couldn't possibly be the graph? First of all, what does the second derivative tell us about? And the first, so what does it tell us about the first function? Concavity. It directly tells us we can use the concavity as a tool for finding other things, but what it tells us about directly is concavity. So can we talk about the concavity of this thing? Wait, so that graph represents B2B? This, this is supposed to represent the weight function. So the function that B dt is the derivative of? It's supposed to be that. Oh, what okay. we're trying to show is that this couldn't possibly be that graph, that okay. this is the derivative of, and that this is the second derivative. This couldn't possibly be that function. Can we talk about the concavity of this function? If we're supposed to use the thing to tell us about concavity to disprove that this could be that function? Mm -hmm. what is? No, no, up and down. Concave up until it's concave down. Okay, at some point, it's concave down. Okay, let's talk about this function and talk about why this function tells us for sure that this could not be the graph of the weight. Of Well, this is the weight of a bird, a bird uh, that starts out 20 grams. And let's just say this B means, it represents the weight of the bird, right? Do you think there's some kind of a upper bound on how big the weight can get? Right? Well, if B equals 100, uh -huh. then we'd be 100 minus 100, which is zero. Well, it's like when it hits 100, it stops moving, but like on the graph, D, well, the second derivative should be at the maximum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Let's say that, there's a, let's say that the, the bird's going to max out at 100 grams. Yes, yeah, 100 grams. Okay. Because um, birds tend to get bigger their whole lives and then die. And not usually <laughs> lose weight. Right? So generally, they gain weight, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then maybe they level off. They don't typically long, live long enough to figure out they need to go on a diet and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, we'll say it only goes up to 100. So at time zero, when it's first weighed, the bird weighs 20 grams. Okay, so the smallest value this could have would be 100 minus 20, and the biggest value we could have is maybe zero. Right, if we put 100 in there for B. So what would you say about the value of this second derivative? So this is, for all values of B that are 20 up to 100, well, 20 up to not quite 100, this should be always negative, right? Yeah. Because you got a negative 1 over 25 times a number that should be positive over that interval, right? If the second derivative is negative, what can we say about the original function? It's coming down. But if you look at this function that they're saying is not supposed, cannot resemble this graph, cannot resemble this graph, this is concave up. This should be concave down. This function, because this is negative, should be concave down the entire interval. So since this isn't concave down over the entire interval, this couldn't possibly be the graph of the weight. 
You gotta be like Steve at first and just like, be what? Be very Steve at first. Right. I feel like Bernie would never do that. Like it'd have to be a bar and like 100 grams. No, it's more than 20 grams. No, for it to be concave down. Or, concave down. Yeah. It should it should be gaining weight like this and then kind of flattening out like that. Yeah, but it's yeah. the way that the skull case is everything. Well, that's the graph that's what the wrong graph is saying. Okay. Oh right, right, right. Okay. So there's that. We'll leave the other one for another time. Just uh, finish up three points more. Just, okay.